Hey guys, we are looking at chapter two, looking at um, section five. We're going to talk about postulates and paragraph proofs. So our vocabulary today comes with a lot of new terms. And so the first two terms are basically one term. A postulate or an axiom is an undeniable truth or principle. Another way of saying that is that it's an unprovable truth or principle that is accepted. So when I think about postulates and axioms, I think about basically definitions. So I'm going to give you a statement, I'll define it, we'll accept that that is the case. And so that's what postulates and axioms will be for us. A proof is a logical um, explanation or discussion that is going to show or prove that something is true. So it's a logical explanation that shows truth. Generally, when we're talking about a proof in geometry, we're going to use axioms and postulates and maybe some other things that we've proven true to prove something else is true. So our proofs will be based on postulates and axioms and this next word here, a theorem. A theorem is a conjecture that you've proven true. A theorem is a conjecture that has been proven true. So for instance, if I tell you that um, every time a certain, um, I don't know, a certain type of cloud forms, there will be rain. Every time a certain kind of cloud forms in the sky, there will be rain. And I'm able to use meteorological postulates and axioms to prove that, then I have a conjecture that is, every time a particular type of cloud forms, there's going to be rain. Then I, if I prove that that's true, then I have a theorem about weather. We're going to have theorems in mathematics, and you're going to see that all the time. And generally, theorems are proved by other previous theorems or axioms and postulates. And the type of argument that we use to prove them in proofs is a deductive argument. You remember a deductive argument starts off with a rule or a law and then it goes to a specific case, right? So we kind of discussed that last time. We start off with a rule or a concept or a set of rules or laws, and then we can identify what's happening specifically. And we were able to do that with our law of detachment and our law of syllogism, if you remember that, right? So we started off with a P that implies Q that was true. And then we said, well, if we have a specific case of P, then Q is going to be true. Or we can have if P implies Q and then Q implies R, then we can see that P implies R with our law of syllogism. All right, I know. So paragraph proof is a proof that is basically made um, using deductive arguments. And we'll look a little bit more at the structure of a paragraph proof. So example three over here is going to really get into the idea of a paragraph proof and so we'll we'll do that for um, that example the pro the proof process is a deductive argument where you start off with a couple things so the first and second thing is that you're gonna start off with a list of the given information and then you're gonna come up with your conjecture what you think is going to happen given that list of information then here in the body of the paragraph, what you're going to do is you're going to use the deductive argument to logically explain a chain of events that's going to, a chain of statements that's going to prove your idea. You're also going to justify your reasoning um, within that um, chain of chain of um, logical statements, and then you're going to just restate the thing that you've proved, which should be pretty much the thing that you started off to prove, started off proving. So a paragraph proof is literally what it says, a proof written in paragraph form with the structure we just talked about. So again, a proof where the reasoning is written in paragraph form. And finally, we've got the term informal proof, which honestly is just another name for paragraph proof. And so it's not that it's not good enough or not logical enough. It's called informal because we'll be talking about another kind of proof that is a two-column proof, and we'll look at that later on. And so this is the informal version of that. With that in mind, let's get to some examples. As a way to kind of think about the idea of postulates and axioms, we're going to just look at some of the postulates and axioms that we have accepted to be true. 
before since we started our um, since we started our journey in geometry so a couple of them are here and they're listed as um, numbered items so we've got like 2.1 to 2.7 and so we've accepted these because these were the way things were defined so there are two um, they're given any two points through any two points there's exactly one line and through any three non-collinear points there's exactly one plane a line contains at least two at least two points so if you got two points you got a line a plane contains at least three non-collinear points these seem very similar but they're actually slightly different and you'll see that difference when we um, utilize them in proofs okay so here it says if two points lie in a plane then the entire line containing those points lies in the plane so if I got these two points a B and it's in a plane remember a plane goes off in every direction infinitely the line that runs through those two points is also contained in the plane and if you think about it it makes logical sense remember we're not going to prove axioms we're not going to prove postulates we accept them and over here we've got a couple of more here we have if two lines intersect then the intersection point is in exactly then they intersect in exactly one point so that gives us kind of the definition of what intersection means doesn't mean they they intersect in more than one point that means the intersection in exactly one that's what intersect means if two planes intersect then their intersection is a line so when we talk about the intersection of a plane we refer to a line so these are kind of like th these concepts these these postulates these axioms are like the groundwork to give us like a common language when we're discussing geometric ideas let's look at our first example so let's look at this first part we're going to explain how the picture illustrates each statement to be true so line M contains points F and G here we have F and G and we have that this is line M point E can also be on line M and so we see that the edge of the building contains points F and G and E and so what we can use the postulate we can use would be postulate 2.3 a line contains at least two points so we have this line down here and we see that it contains several points and so that's what justifies this statement let's go ahead and take a look at this next one lines s and t intersect at point d let's look over here we see the lattice work on this building lines s and t intersect at point d do you remember the postulate that talks about the intersection of two lines is exactly one point? Let's go back up and check it out. Looks like it's right here. If two lines intersect, then their intersection point is then their intersection in the, is exactly one point. So the postulate uh, 2.6 2.6 says that if two lines intersect, then their intersection is in exactly one point. Notice that every time I write the postulate, I'm writing actually what it says. It's going to be hard. We're going to get a lot of postulates and theorems with different numbers. It's going to be hard to memorize the 2.3 refers to what and 2.6 refers to what. We will probably practice writing out the actual postulate. I know it seems a lot of work, like a lot of work. It won't be or abbreviations of it when we need them. And you'll see what I mean as we continue. So here looking at number two, we're going to analyze some statements using our postulates and we're going to determine if these statements are ooh, sometimes always or never true. So let's see if we can get a normal pen and we can handle this. All right, cool. So if two coplanar lines intersect, coplanar means they're on the same plane. So if two coplanar lines intersect, then their point of intersection lies in the same plane as the two lines. So here's our two lines. Let's call them M and L. They intersect. Then does this point lie on the same plane? Logically, we would be like, yeah, because clearly what else makes sense? But if we have to justify our statements with our, um, with our postulates, then we got to go back to that list. And the theorem I'm thinking about is theorem 2. Point, I mean, the uh, postulate I'm thinking about is 2.5. It says if two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those points 
lie in that plane. Let's go back through that again. If two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those two points lie in the plane, right? And then over here, we've got if two lines intersect, then their intersection is in exactly one point. So looking at our situation again, if two coplanar lines intersect, then the point of intersection lies on this, then the point of intersection, the single point, okay, lies in the plane as the two other lines. Yes, it does. And it honestly is by uh, postulate 2.5. It's by postulate 2.5. Because postulate 2.5 says that if you've got two points of a line that's on a plane, then all the points, that whole line is contained on the plane. And so since this point is on both of these lines that are already contained in the plane, then this point has to be contained in the plane. It's also coplanar. So if two points lie in a plane, then all the points on the line are on the plane. And that's what we have for this one. And that comes from postulate 2.5. And this is always true. Let's look at this guy. So is it true that four points are always non-collinear? Are four points Four points are non-collinear. Is this sometimes, always, or never true? And we can have four points, one, two, three, four, and clearly they're collinear. We can have four points that lie on one line, right? So is this always true? Nah, but it might sometimes be true that you can have four points that are non-collinear. Do we have any justification for this? So I'm going to put sometimes, and let's check out our list to see if we can justify it. So when we look at um, the theorem, uh, postulate 2.3, if you remember that one, it says that a line contains at least two points. So that means just given two points, I'm definitely sure to have a line. It doesn't say any four points are definitely going to be on a line. So this is sometimes true that all four points could be on a line, but we could have four points that are not on one line, as we mentioned before. So sometimes true by postulate 2.3 that says a line contains at least two points. So it's time for us to write our first paragraph proof. So given that M is the midpoint of some segment XY, write a paragraph proof to show that XM has to be equivalent to MY. So sometimes it's nice to have a little picture. So here I've got a segment XY. Given that M is the midpoint of XY, write a paragraph proof to show that XM is congruent to MY. So what I'm trying to prove is this, the congruency of these two segments, right? And what I'm given is this, okay? So we've got our given statement, M is the midpoint of XY, and the thing we're trying to prove. So now we're gonna go from here to here. So let's start off with, if M is the midpoint of M of XY, then there's some stuff that we know. So we know that from the definition of the midpoint of a segment, right? From that definition, from the definition of the midpoint of a segment, we know that XM has to equal MY. And remember, when you don't have the line at the top, what you're talking about is the length of the segment. So we know that the length of XM is equal to the length of MY. And also, by definition, if XM is equal to MY in terms of its length, what that means is, this symbol means implies, what that implies is that XM, that segment, is congruent. Remember, congruent means has the same size and shape this segment XM is now congruent to MY by definition of congruence. So I've done everything I needed to do to logically say, therefore, thus, these two segments are indeed congruent. All right, so now what do I have? My conjecture was that if M is the midpoint of XY, then XM and MY are now congruent, and we were able to uh, justify that from our discussion um, using some of the uh, definitions we had earlier on in the uh, text. Finally, we're gonna close the chapter with our theorem that we just proved. We proved that if M is the midpoint of 
a segment AB, then AM is congruent to MB. Please take your time when doing the exercise associated with section 25. I know it's going to be a little bit challenging, but it'll be worth your while. Let me know if there's anything that I can help you with. I'll see you.